Secondly, uh, talk about going on a cruise and going to health retreats. Today's message, talking about 10 ways to avoid burnout. You know what like that they going through a bit of burnout in their life? Yeah, I think we can all say at some stage, we're exhausted, aren't we? So at some stage, we are either overscheduled, we're either exhausted, or we just are overwhelmed with all the busyness in our lives. Years ago, we preached a series called The Busy Trap. And we talked about how the devil can't steal your salvation if he can't, uh, you know, confuse you and distract you. He will make you busy so that you're too busy to do what God's actually called you to do. And I think in this day and age, we've got so many pressures with us, don't we? Work, family, bills, you know, all the extra things that go along with ministry and all the busy stuff in life. And we need to get back to the main thing, don't we? You know, there's a great quote that says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I know for me personally, uh, I have had life sort of, you know, being a senior pastor for seven years now, uh, working part-time doing a Christian breakfast show every morning, uh, as well on the radio. Uh, juggling my time uh, is a very difficult thing to do. But we need to keep going to the source. We need to keep going to the King. Saying, Lord, what is important? What's the most important thing? What's the priorities in my life? So we're going to just fly through these 10 points today. And uh, just want to say it's probably the worst day physically for me to be sharing this message. <laughs> Although it was lovely to go away to Noosa to this health retreat. Uh, 2.30 in the morning, my son woke me up uh, sick. And, and you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you, what was going through my mind? Because... Uh, like I said, we got home last night and there was this big carpet snake outside the kids' room. So I went to a room and I shushed it away. And, and you know, you think about it. Maybe I've annoyed him. Maybe he's going to come back after me now. You, know? <laughs> you, you think, you know, you know when you're at so 2.30 in the morning when my son was coughing and spluttering, I, I, I've, got, I've got to be honest with you, I had this terrible thought. I don't know if anyone saw in the news in Canada a few months ago. Something like a, I don't know, a 12 foot python ate two children. I don't know if you heard that. Seriously, it happened. There was a guy that was keeping pets in like large pythons, and the kids next door who used to play with them, somehow the python got out. And, and when I heard at 2 30 in the morning my son coughing his funny, I thought, it's that snake. And I got up and I, you know, and you know what it's like when in the middle of the night, if, if it's just you know, going to the loo or something, I'll go back to sleep easily, you know. <laughs> um, but when you get excited or, you know, adrenaline pumping, you know, so, you know, I went and checked him, he was fine, he was just a bit sick. But I, but I go back to bed, I'm thinking, maybe the snake's going to get me, you know. <laughs> so, it's just, I'm, just, I'm a bit weird, I've just got to ask for your forgiveness for that. But sometimes in the middle of the night, you just, your mind goes crazy, doesn't it, you know. And then I started thinking, I'm going to preach tomorrow on Avoiding burnout. I need a good sleep tonight. You know. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm, I'm going through my points in my head. Okay, Lord, help me. Help me do these things so I can sleep well and not appear burned out in the morning. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> anyway, but one of the points in here, and I'll, I'll jump through a little bit early, is the truth is when you're doing stuff for Jesus, when you're doing stuff for God, it actually energizes you. You actually receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So even though physically, right now, in the flesh, I wouldn't feel like I'd be the best example to preach on how to avoid burnout. In the Spirit, I know that God's Holy Spirit is with me. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Nothing is impossible for those who believe. Amen. It's not by might or by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Amen. So, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit and your anointing here. And Lord, that it's not about me today, it's not about the words and, and this, this talk that's coming out of my mouth, it's about the power of God. Your word says the kingdom is not a kingdom of talk, but a kingdom of power. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to come in power. And Lord, speak to us today. Help us as a people to remain energized, focused, prioritized, putting you first, Lord God. And may we not be burnt out, but may we be fired up. By your Holy Spirit's presence, we ask in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. amen, amen. So now I feel ready to preach. Okay, so last Sunday, uh, I was preaching through the book of Mark. It's uh, last 
said, you know, uh, a couple of 10 or 12 weeks or so, I've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark up to about Mark 13 uh, next week. Uh, and just at the end of the service, I just felt God say to me, there's a number of people in our church that are really exhausted and burnt out, and God wants to energize them and, and fill them with the Holy Spirit. And uh, it was just a, just a short word and idea at the end of the service. I just opened up the altar call, and there were a dozen people at least who came out for prayer. We had our prayer team here, and everyone just said, Oh, I am just so worn out by now. I'm just so exhausted. And I think there's a few factors. I think uh, at this time of the year, and it's, you know, it's a nice way to say it, you know, to justify, you know, but the truth is, at this time of the year, everything's building up for Christmas. You know, there's only seven weeks to go to Christmas now. You know, there's only four weeks to go until school finishes. My wife is freaking out about that. Six weeks to holiday. Uh, there's Christmas parties. There's Christmas shopping. There's holidays to be planned. There's deadlines to be met before the end of the year. There's all sorts, you know, there's all sorts of ministry things happening. There's everything just kind of has to get done before the end of the year. So for us here in Australia, this is it's a built-up time. So like, oh, how am I going to get all this done before the end of the year? So I think that's one reason. I think, actually think the other reason is the heat. I think this time of year, as soon as it starts to get hotter, uh, particularly here in Queensland, everyone's like, oh yeah, whatever, mate, I could be bothered. You know? <laughs> I've had enough, I've had a rest. I'm going to go and worship God in front of the new air conditioner over here. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like so exhausted all the time because of the heat. But I actually do find that we adjust to the heat and we get used to it. I would love to have air conditioning in this room. I'd love to have like a false ceiling and you know, a wall and air con, you know, it'd be great. Anyone's got a couple of million dollars to donate, let us know. Um, but I actually think we do adjust to the heat. And really, in this building, we only have about five or six really hot Sundays a year. We can cope for the rest of the year. Can't we? We're tough. We're, we're Aussie. We're history makers, aren't we? Amen? Um, and I think, so I think there's the business at the end of the year. I think there's the, uh, uh, the heat and, you know, we'll just want to talk about that. But I also think the enemy is trying to take out the saints and the sons and daughters of God. And we've got to be aware that we fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to be aware that there is an enemy that's trying to make us busy, who's trying to distract us, who's trying to, uh, you know, I mean, I, was, I went to Japan on a mission trip a, a few weeks ago. The week before, I was flat out on, in bed with fevers and sick, and the devil was just trying to take me out before I got to go on a mission trip. Now, it's interesting, as soon as we got to New Hope Key through the church, we visited there. There's this gorgeous Japanese lady who's like the founder of the church. Uh, she's like Pastor Krista, uh, one of the Korean pastors who's been part of our church. I said, oh, I was really sick just before I came to Japan. And she goes, that was just the devil trying to stop you. <laughs> You're an overcomer in Jesus' name. I said, amen. Thank you, sister. <laughs> um, but we've just got to realize when the devil tries to affect us with sickness, when we're too busy, when we're... Uh, mentally exhausted and drained as well, we've got, to, we've got to realize that that's one of the main ways the devil attacks us. Sure, he attacks us physically, but he attacks us in our thoughts. I've no doubt the devil is the one that put that thought into my mind that my kid was being by a snake at 2.30 this morning, you know? I've no doubt where it came from. So you just resist the enemy and he'll flee from you in Jesus' name, amen? Uh, so I just, I just, they're the three main things that I think are the, are the reasons why we get worn out. And these are the keys. Uh, actually, after last Sunday morning, praying for all those people, I went home, and I often have a bit of a nana nap after church on Sunday, just to be honest with you. I had a little sleep after, a little snooze after lunch. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, and I couldn't sleep, and I actually felt the Lord say, oh, this is what I'm going to preach on next week. So I started talking about all these last week, and it just it just flowed, these ten points. So this is what they are. I'm just going to fly through them today. Don't want to go too long, because we've got church lunch today. Woohoo! Okay, so... Uh, after praying for many people last week, we run down exhausted. I felt the Lord giving this message: biblical principles for rejuvenating and refreshing. The Lord wants to reach us. Uh, the Lord wants to reach the world through His people. But if we are worn out all the time, we've got nothing to give. So if we follow the guidelines for His Word and put Him first, we'll be able to achieve the mission that God's called us to. Amen. So we've got to learn to get filled so that we can give. That's the way the Lord works. We receive the Father's love and we give out the Father's love. But if we're too exhausted, we've got nothing to give. So we're going to learn to fill our tank and get the vibe. Let's look at the Word of God in Isaiah 40, verse 28. This is the key verse the Lord gave me. And, uh, it's our verse of the week as well. You've heard Annie read it out before. 
The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens, uh, of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Who wants that? Yeah, oh, everyone wants that in Jesus' name. Isn't that a wonderful verse? You know, the key there is those who hope in the Lord. In our church name, you hope. Because we want to offer the new hope of Jesus Christ to Brisbane, Australia, and the nations of the world. You know, I love the imagery there of eagles. Uh, Cole Stringer, who I actually just interviewed at the History Makers TV this week, great man of God, has released a book about eagles. He's done all this scientific research, he's a very smart man. And he shows how these eagles just launch themselves off these high mountains and they just spread out their wings. And they know that the patterns of the wind will be such that they'll just rise. All they've got to do is stretch out their arms. Occasionally they've got a little bit of a flap. But you don't see them like hummingbirds, you know. You know. <laughs> they don't get all busy and stressed, do they? They're not like a hummingbird, like a, like a Martha in the Bible. You know, busy, 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 you know. They just stretch their wings out and they just cruise. And they let the wind do its work. That's what we need to be doing as Christians. We shouldn't be like hummingbirds, oh, busy, 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 I've got to do this, we should just be stretching out our wings and saying, Lord, I'm hoping in you. I'm trusting in you. I will run and not grow weary. I will walk and not grow faint. And one of the symbols for the Holy Spirit in the Bible is the wind of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? So when we hope in the Lord, the winds of the Holy Spirit blow and take us up to higher and higher and higher and higher. That's the way the kingdom of God works. When we hope in the Lord, when we wait on the Lord, we will rise up on wings like eagles. Friend, let me tell you, I've quoted that Bible verse so many times <laughs> over the last 20, 30 years as a Christian. I have just, uh, time and time again, when I've been exhausted, when I've been burnt out, when I've been flat out like a lizard drinking, as busy as a one-armed wallpaper hanger, you know, no matter how flat out I am, flat out I am I'll always take the time to go back to God and say, God, I'm going to Wait on you. I'm going to hope in you. Point number one today. Spend time with Jesus in the Word and in prayer. You know, it's the foundation of our church. You know, New Hope Church, there's about 140 around. Uh, there's you know, a mega church in Hawaii with about 15,000. They've planted about 140 churches around Japan, the Philippines, Australia, uh, Myanmar and Burma, uh, in the west coast of, the, of America. These New Hope churches are great evangelistic churches, they're great worshipping churches, they do all this great serving in the community with New Hope community care, they do all this great stuff. But the one foundation we all have together is that we all have a foundation in doing daily devotions in the Word of God. We read through the Bible every year together and literally we're on the same page. We've got this journaling plan where we read uh, two, uh, two or three Old Testament chapters a day, one or two New Testament chapters a day, depending on the day. And, we're, and we do our journaling, our, our, our soap journaling, scripture, observation, application, and prayer. We read through these scriptures. And you know what? I think it's the most powerful thing for us as a church. Recently we've been reading through the book of Job. And uh, in the New Testament, we've been reading through the book of Mark, which I've been preaching through. I think that was a God thing as well. And that happened to, uh, to you know, fall in line at the same time. Uh, it's been interesting to read through Job. Gee, went through a lot, didn't he? Eh? His friends really didn't help him out either, did they? <laughs> Job lost everything. He got sores all over his body. He was, he was exhausted. He was worn out. He lost his whole family. Friends didn't help him. But what did he do? He kept his focus on the Lord. And the Lord doubly blessed him at the end of his life. You see the incredible blessing that came at the end of his life. Because he did not curse God. He stayed the course for the Lord. It's amazing to know that all the New York churches, 140 of us in total, we've all just been reading through that together. So no matter what trouble or persecution or struggles we have in our life, we can think, well, it's not as bad as what Job went through. I'm just going to cling on to God like Job did, you know. Let's have the same faith and the same perseverance that Job did. 
And in the New Testament, we're reading through the, the Gospel of Mark, reading through all the miracles and the compassion of Jesus, just like we've been preaching through in this series on Mark I've been doing. And I truly believe it's one of the keys to every single one of us that we start our day in the Word of God. And not just in the mornings, but throughout the day. Quoting verses like that from Isaiah. That the Word of God be in the That's why I love working in Christian radio. On Christian radio, every hour we'll read out a Bible verse to start the hour. Throughout the, the, the day there'll be Christian songs on with worship songs. Songs from artists like Charmaine, you know, uh, with brilliant Christian lyrics, inspirational worship. You're filling up your tank when you're, when you're waiting on the Lord. We've got to make sure that our foundation is on the Word of God because we know the story that Jesus told. The wise man built his house upon the rock because he heard the words of the Lord and he obeyed them. The foolish man built his house on the sand. He heard the words of the Lord but he didn't obey them. And then when the storm came, it was all washed away. Friend, if you're going through a storm of burnout right now, if you're going through a storm of business right now, if you're going through a storm of relationship struggles or financial struggles, whatever your storm is right now, the word of the Lord for you is, hear the words of Jesus and obey them. Because that's when your life's on the rock. When your life's on the rock, no matter what storm comes, you'll stand firm on the rock. We've got to make sure that we are a people of the word of God. Now I've got to confess, I actually haven't read my Bible for a couple of years now. It's on the shelf. It's getting dusty. I've read a lot over the years, but the last couple of years I haven't read it much. So I read my Bible on the iPad now and on my iPhone and on the laptop. And, you know, the thing is, that there are many different ways that the Bible is available to us today. Not just the old book. And, I, and right, if, you, if you're old school and you have a Bible, put on you. Keep it up. But you can, you, can, you can have the Bible in your tablet. You can have your Bible on your iPhone. There's a Bible app that you can get text regularly with Bible verses. You can put Bible verses on your Facebook and Twitter. You can, you can share the Word of God in your conversation. It's not just the habit of reading the Scriptures. And you're not meant to do it just religiously and legalistically. It's where the Word of God gets inside your heart. And it comes out in your life every day. We're meant to be living stones. We're meant to be um, speaking the Word of God all day, every day, wherever we go. Get the Word of God inside of you. Actually, uh, there's just a, a journal this week and... I shared a, a story where Pastor Greg Laurie interviewed about uh, in, interviewed Pastor Chuck Smith, who just passed away recently, one of the uh, fathers of the Jesus movement in America. And he asked Chuck Smith, he said, if you could interview a young Chuck Smith at the start of ministry, uh, if you could give him some advice, what would you give? And he actually said, stay the course. That's the advice that I'd give to a young Chuck Smith. Said, well, that's good advice because many times in ministry we don't stay the course to go off in different directions, but we need to stay the course of God's course. And I asked myself that question. Now that I'm really old, 38, you know, what would I give advice to a young Matt Prater? You know, I started out in ministry at the age of 17 as a youth pastor. If I could go back in time and meet with myself at the age of 17, what would be the best advice I would give myself? And I would say today, I would say to Matt Prater at the age of 17, get into the Word of God every day. Fill yourself up with the Word of God. Because for me as a Christian, I spent many years where I'd read the Word of God when I had to preach. I'd read the Word of God when I was curious about something. I'd read the Word of God when I was curious about the Scriptures for many years. When I became a new head pastor seven years ago, they said to me, you've got to be journaling every day, reading the Word of God every day. And I thought, that's a bit legalistic. That's, you know, I'm a spiritual, Pentecostal, spirit-led man. I don't need to do that, you know. I can read the Bible when I feel like it. But I'll tell you what, it has been, the, I, I think, the wisest decision I've ever made in my life to commit every day to filling myself up with the Word of God. Because when you fill up, in the Word of God in the morning, and it flows out the rest of the day. Amen? So that's my advice to you today. Get into the Word of God every day. You can do the New Hope Journal, you can do the Word for the day, or whatever devotional you want to do. But get into the Word of God early every day, and it will flow out for the rest. And I actually believe it's a real key. Open the Lord and you'll renew your strength. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's starting to go on the right foot. Do I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Now, uh, point number two. When you follow your dream in your heart, you'll energize inspired and motivated. That's actually meant to be number two up there. Yeah. That's one, one point one. Anyway, number two. When you follow your dream, you are now, I actually believe it's similar to the quote that uh, Chuck Smith gave to the younger Chuck Smith. Stay the course. I actually believe that, for me, I've found in my life, 
When I go off and do something that isn't my calling and my dream and my gifting, it just drains me. There are things we can do that drain us, and there are things that we can do that fill us up. So for me, preaching, for example, even though physically I don't feel like getting up here and doing this today because I didn't get much sleep, uh, this energises me. I love it. I love getting into the Word of God. I love seeing everyone's smiling faces. I love it when you laugh at my jokes. <laughs> hey, can you hear my new joke, by the way? It's a good one. You'll love it. It's actually very relevant to this right now. I forgot about it, but you know, the Holy Spirit just reminded me to tell you this joke. So. <laughs> it's not because I enjoy telling jokes. It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Uh, I actually heard this one during the week and I thought it's so important this one. So there's a guy who was a real worry ward. He worried all day about money, worried about the weather, worried about his job, worried about getting sick, worried about this, worried about that. And everyone was sick of him because he was just a worry ward. Anyway, one day he turned up, his mate, he turned up to, to visit his mate, his mate said, What's wrong with you? You're happy. You're not worried anymore. And he goes, Oh, it's okay. I pay a guy to worry for me now. He said, What? He said, Yeah, I had this idea. I put an ad in the paper. And I said, I'm looking to employ someone as a full-time warrior to worry for me. Great idea. So the guy, this, this guy applied for the ad. He, he, he got the job. And he says, now I pay the guy $10,000 a day to worry for me. And his mate said, wow, you're, you're not that rich. You can't afford that. He goes, well, that's for him to worry about. <laughs> The truth is, we do worry a lot, don't we? We worry a lot about money, we worry a lot about our job, we worry about this, we worry about that. I was actually sharing a leaders meeting on Thursday night, we had a bunch of our leaders together, that we need to have a positive outlook in life, we need to have a faith-filled outlook. We need to lift up our eyes to the Lord and trust in the Lord and not worry all the time. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, tomorrow will worry about itself, trust in the Lord. Look at the, the birds of the field, the Lord provides for them. If He provides for them, how much more will He provide for you? When we trust in the Lord, when we honour Him and we put Him first, it takes all this stress and pressure and worry off us. Let's face it, all the stuff about burnout here, a lot of it's connected to the stress and the worry and the anxiety we have. And they say that like 70 or 80% of all diseases and sicknesses comes from stress. It comes from people worrying too much. I love that song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. You know, it's such an important uh, proverb, isn't it? That we don't worry about things, but we trust in the Lord. You know, I'm getting off track there. That's what happens when I tell jokes. When you follow your dream in your heart, you're energised, inspired, and motivated. Let's look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. For this reason I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has, uh, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control. One of the things that we're always encouraging people to do in New Hope is find out what your spiritual gifts are. Find out what your primary gifts are. For me, I'm an evangelist. That's my favourite thing, seeing souls saved. Uh, in Japan, we saw 14 people come to Christ uh, over, over the three churches we preached out there. That was the most exciting thing for me to see. I love spending time with the pastors there. I love the outreaching. I love doing this and that. But seeing those souls saved, that energises me, that vitalises me, that, that gives me uh, inspiration to go on. Most weeks here at New Hope Brisbane, we'll have people give their heart to Christ at the end of the service, you know. That is what I love about this church. We're a harvest church. We're winning souls for Christ. If we stop seeing souls converted at New Hope Brisbane, I would seriously question whether I'm called to be here. Because I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm called to, to win souls. I'm called to bear fruit in that area. What, what is your primary gift? Are you... Uh, a worshipper, are you meant to be in the worship team? Are you meant to be musical, part of the team? Are you meant to be a teacher who teaches people the Word of God? Maybe you run a home group or you, you, you teach in the kids' church. Uh, have you got a gift of hospitality? Are you called to be blessing people with beautiful gifts and food and being generous? Are you called to, to help out at running a drug rehab, helping men get off addiction? We've got the guys from Reto here today who do an amazing job. They've got seven men living there who are getting off their addictions and getting their life right with God. Uh, I know that that energises Antonio and Lily when they do that. Because they were in that lifestyle many years ago and they had their lifestyle, life transformed and now God's using their mess to be their message. God's using their scars to be their stars. God used their tests to be their testimony. 
and another energizes them when they're doing what God's called them to do. You might be stuck in, in some job or some area in your life where you are not doing what God has actually called you to do. You're not using your gifts for God. Let me tell you, that's one of the most dangerous things that will blame you. You've got to find your gifting. And you've got to put your hand to the plow and you've got to focus on it. Because when you're doing what God's called you to do, you're energized. You're fired up. Charmaine, she loves to travel the world singing and telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. If she got stuck in an office job somewhere, it would probably drive her a lot, you know? She's cool to be out there using the gift for God. What's your gift? what the Bible says, fan into flame the gift of God. Ask God to fan into flame. You know how you have a, a little, you know, you light a fire, you get a, you get a few little twigs together and some paper and you try and get it. What do you do to get the fire going? Blow on it to get it going. That's what it's talking about here. Whatever the gift of God you've got is, get the Holy Spirit to fan it into flame and let your gift grow. Serve God with all your heart. Because there you will be. If, if you follow the dream in your heart and you give things, you'll be energized, inspired, and motivated. Number three. This is more of a practical one. Uh, and I'm not going to be all Bible-based and spiritual in this one. I've got a few practical tips that I thought the Lord's given me here. Find what fills and drains your tank. A little bit similar to the, to the second one, but uh, I just wanted to say for me, for example, uh, this has been this principle here, Pastor Wayne Gilero from Hawaii teaches on this. Quite a bit, and it, and it has basically saved me as a pastor. I don't think I would have survived seven years as a senior pastor if I didn't work out what filled my tank and what drained my tank. Now, for those of you who know me well, I'll tell you a few things that uh, drain my tank. So, long counselling meetings drain my tank. I can sit there and I'll talk with someone, I'll pray with someone, and I'll listen to them, and I'll share them the word of God, and then I'll be ready to go out for lunch. You know? <laughs> I can meet maybe two or three times I'll meet with someone and counsel them and care for them. But after that, I'll be looking for someone who's an expert, who is gifted at that, and I'll delegate, or I'll send them on to that person. For me, if I had to do that all day long, if I had to have tea and cucumber sandwiches all day long and offering counseling sessions, it would drain me like you would believe. I love people, I'll, I'll give them a bit of time and I'll, I'll focus on them, but it's just not my gifting. Uh, there are people in this church I know who could do that, like Carol, for example, my wife. She is awesome. At it. She'll sit with people all day long and talk to the cows come home. Uh, she loves that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I'll send people, you know, if I didn't identify that that drains me, I wouldn't have survived as a pastor. Uh, so I've got to work out what my gifting is, you know. Uh, things like, uh, you know, practical things like limiting screen time. Uh, it's just one little practical thing. A lot of people spend all day long on the computer, all day long watching TV, all day long like electronic devices. Physically, that will actually drain you. Uh, it's not good for you. You've got to make sure you have boundaries of how much time you spend on, on screen time. That might be something that drains you. You've got to be careful not to let that drain you all day long. Uh, I've just got a whole list of them here. Um, uh, for me, some of the things that fill my tank, for example, is worship. I love, like, beautiful worship this morning. That just fills me up. I'm ready to preach. I can preach all day long after some beautiful worship time like that, you know? That's why I love putting on worship music and working in Christian radio and any, any chance I get on worship and all that fills my tank. Other things that fill my tank are date night with my wife. Uh, if we don't get it, we try and have a date night every week or every fortnight at least. If we don't get our date night in, uh, going out to a movie or out to dinner or out for a walk at South Bank or whatever, um, it, it, it's a strain in our relationship because we don't get that quality one on one time together. We try and have that regular time and it fills our tank in our marriage. Uh, having holidays regularly. Uh, interestingly, after the Japan trip, you know, while I was away, Carol had to do, you know, preach at church and she had to run all the things in the office and help with Annie, do all this stuff at church. It was full busy while I was away. And then when, when we came back, uh, we thought, oh, we better just get back to it. We just get on with all the things we've got to do. And interestingly, we had an opportunity to go to the Gold Coast to the Eight to eight pastors gathering, and we thought, you know what? Let's just book a night at a hotel, take the kids out of school, and have some good family time together. Because I've been away for eleven days, kids have missed me. We were just going to get on with the job. We thought, you know what? We've got to fill our tank together as a family. So we we made the sacrifice. You know, uh, we took a couple of days away, and it was just the best thing for our family to do that. And then this week, the Lord blessed us with the time at Musa as well. Obviously, the Lord wanted us to have more time to fill our tanks. Uh, I just think. 
sometimes if you are if you are up against the wall and your schedule's busy and you're and, and you're crazy busy, sometimes you've got to make the tough call to say, you know what, I'm gonna have some time out. I've got to get filled up. Because hey, if you got if you're not filled up, you've got nothing to give, have you? If you are drained in your tank and you're empty, you're not good to anyone. So you've got to find what fills your tank. What is it for you? It could be painting, it could be music, it could be swimming, it could be going to the beach, it could be reading a book, it could be going for a walk. Well, whatever it is, find what fills your tank and make sure you, you fill it up. Because in this day and age, uh, there's so many pressures and so many things that, that will drain us. Make sure you fill. Obviously, the Word of God and worship, things like that, uh, are important spiritual things. But what are the the physical things uh, that, uh, that fill you up. Okay, number four, eat healthy, avoid gluttony, and be self-controlled. Uh, many of you know we did this 10-week fit club at the radio station and here at the, the church where we threw out a challenge for people to pick a goal weight and work towards that goal weight. I actually went from 90 kilos, that's oh, right, I was at 100 kilos and my goal was to get to 95. Over the 10 weeks I got to 96 kilos. I didn't quite get to 95, I was almost there. And then I went to Japan and I ate way too much sushi and I put a bit of a couple of kilos on it. But I'm back on I'm back on the wagon again, trying to get healthy. And uh, for me, it's lifestyle decisions. It's not getting drive through when you're late. It's going home and actually making a healthy sandwich instead. Or uh, it's uh, it's uh, not overeating. You know they say it's wise to only eat 80 or 90 percent of of uh, a portion every time you eat something. Uh, but here in Australia, we we, we eat way too much. And, this time of the year, we're all going to get invited to Christmas parties. There's going to be all sorts of fun stuff. There's church lunch today. You don't have to fill your whole plate up. Maybe just 80, 90 percent. You know, it's it's having self-control in the portions we eat. It's being careful not to eat junk, but to eat the healthy. Eat God's lollies. You know, that's what I tell my kids. Eat your lettuce. It's God's lollies. They don't really believe it, but I try it. Eat the stuff that God created. Eat your apples. Eat your tomatoes. Eat, eat God's lollies first. Uh, it's interesting that. Often the church will talk about all these sins, you know, that we can commit, you know, we're not meant to murder, we're not meant to steal, we're not meant to lie, but the Bible way to this gluttony is a sin. It's actually an important thing not to overeat. It's important to have self-control when it comes to our eating habits. Uh, and also, uh, uh, being self-controlled is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Here's a verse from 1 Corinthians 6. It says, do, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you are bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. That verse is actually, in context, is actually about sexual promiscuity and honouring God with your body sexually. Uh, we can also appropriate it uh, to our eating habits. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's make sure we honour God. Everything that goes into our body, let's make sure that we're honouring God in what we eat. Uh, let's make sure that we put Him first. Number five, exercise daily. Stay in shape so you're ready for every assignment the Lord gives you. Now, many of you know my health story over the last six years. About six years ago, I got really sick with glandular fever and had all these complications, and it was this thing called still disease. I had rheumatoid arthritis, I had nausea, I couldn't sleep, insomnia, all sorts of problems. Actually, I had a month off um, about six years ago, and then every year the devil came back and attacked me um, for the last five years. And just before Japan was the last time I had this sickness, you know. And for me, I actually felt the Lord say to me, Matt, you've got to stand in faith, you've got to rebuke the enemy, you've got to uh, not receive any sickness that the Lord gives to you and, and overcome it. And I, and I believe that, and that's, that's my point of view. But I also felt the Lord say, Matt, the healthier you are physically, the easier it will be you to fight off these attacks of sicknesses. You understand what I'm saying? If I'm fitter and I've got more energy and I'm healthier and I'm stronger and bigger guns and you know six pack, all that kind of stuff, I've got an eight pack right now, I'm trying to work it down to a six pack. If I if I'm fitter, when that sickness comes against me, I'm actually stronger physically to overcome it, as well as I've got to be stronger spiritually to overcome it, if you know what I mean. And you know, even for example, going to the Japan trip. We had to do a lot of walking up and down stairs, carrying our suitcases on trains. We, we got on the bullet train. Uh, you know how they have peak hour trains? They've actually got butt pushers in Japan. You know that? They've got these guys in white gloves and hats on. And 
And here's Pastor Brad and I with our big bags. We try to get on the train and we're up the stairs and we're really exhausted. And, and the doors close. But before the doors close, these guys literally push you in. And like we're standing at the moment, like sardines in the train. Uh, I could have easily said to Brad, you know what? I'm so exhausted. I can't go on. Let's go to a cafe and have a caramel latte and chill out. This is too much, you know. But you know what? Because I've been working out doing fit club, you know, these guns, you know. Uh, because I've been working out, uh, I actually felt like I was physically able to get on with the mission trip. Um, seriously, a year ago, I could say I probably wouldn't have been as fit enough as I was on this trip. Um, because God called me to go on this mission. It was up to me to make sure I was well enough and fit enough to, to, to get through it. What's the mission that God's called you to? Have you got the right uh, energy? Have you got the right fitness? Are you ready? If God sends you to go to Cambodia and travel around and preach for two weeks, have you got the right fitness to be able to do it? I just think we need to be prepared for where God calls us to. I actually think, I mean, think of um, Philip in uh, the book of Acts. He was preaching to someone, all of a sudden he was zapped away and he was preaching on the beach somewhere, you know. That's a cheap way to do missions. I like the sound of it. <laughs> but what if God zapped us away today and sent us to Cambodia and said, right, go and preach for two weeks in Cambodia. Would you be fit enough and healthy enough to get on with a job? I want to make sure I'm always ready for whatever God calls me to do. I want to make sure I'm in, in maximum capacity. Uh, I don't want to be one of these uh, pastors who's like, oh yeah, it's been a long day. Oh, it's 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm going out to bed. <laughs> I don't want to be worn out all the time. I want to make sure I'm filled up physically and spiritually and ready for whatever God has for me. Okay, so, uh, the Bible says there in Timothy 4, 7 to 8, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. I promise for both the present life and the life to come. But, so there's um, uh, the Apostle Paul acknowledging. Physical training is of some value. A lot of people go, oh yeah, he's just saying that because spiritual training is more important. But he's actually saying physical training is of some value. It, it is of some value. So value it. Make the most of it. Join a gym, go for a walk, go for a swim, do whatever, whatever you can do to, to, to stay fit. Uh, and, but godliness, of course, and spiritual training is far more important, so I don't neglect that as well. I interviewed a guy this week for History Makers TV named Luke Holt. Uh, he has recently just lost 53 kilos. He's now down to 109 kilos. It's a breakfast announcer in Juice 1073 at the Gold Coast. And he told me this story, he said, just one week ago, his little four-year-old son was running towards the road. And he's going, stop! I can't remember the kid's name, Jimmy. Stop, Jimmy, stop! And then he realised he's actually fit enough now to run and catch him. And so he ran and he caught him before he got to the road. He said a few months ago, when he was 100 and whatever, 50, 60 kilos, whatever he was, he wouldn't have had the energy to run after him and save his son. He just would have had to yell and hope that his son obeyed him. And he said, mate, I haven't finished yet. He's down to 109 kilos. He said, I've still got a couple of spare tyres here to polish off. He's I said, you should be like me. I, I, I managed my weight on radio stations. You know, I, was, I was 101 FM. I was down to 96.5 FM. And my goal was going to 1611 AM. Poor BC. But uh, he said to me, I realised that six months ago I was really no good to anyone because I was, I was so overweight. But I, I feel like God has called me uh, to do all this work for Him. And this is, this is part of my worship to God. He actually said it to me. This is part of my worship to God to get this shape to God's going to do. Really to God anyway. Um, okay, so number six, laugh. No, no, seriously, that was an instruction. Laugh. Yeah. Should I tell another joke? Will that really make you laugh? No. <laughs> laugh, don't be so serious. Actually, I will tell you another joke. Um, Pastor Brad, this, Pete Watson often says that I tell jokes for the like lead balloons, you know, they just drop really fast. Anyway, so this is one that I kind of really messed up. So in Japan, we were there with these beautiful Japanese people, and uh, I was with uh, Pastor Brad and uh, David Ramadrum, and he's a young guy who's teaching English over there. And, uh, I was really exhausted one night, and uh, it's actually quite tiring talking to a translator all the time. But I actually thought this would be funny 
more for my benefit than for theirs. <laughs> so I told this joke and I tried to get Brad to translate it to them. And I did it because I knew he'd have a real hard time translating it. <laughs> and I just wanted to see him dig himself into a hole. And he's, he's looking after the kids at the moment so I can say whatever I want. So, anyway. <laughs> but, um, so this is the joke. Actually, I've heard Pastor Wayne tell this. This could be seen as a racist joke, but like, if, if it's taken in the right way, it's not racist at all. It's silly, you know, because we all have different language. Anyway, so I'm not a racist. I love everyone, no matter what nationality you're from. It's a funny... Anyway, I'll just tell the joke, okay? All right, okay. So, an Australian, a Japanese, and a Spanish guy land, <laughs> land on an island somewhere. And the Australian guy goes, all right, we better go and get prepared before it gets dark. He said, I'll go kill an animal and have it ready for dinner. We'll meet back here at 5 o'clock. He says to the Japanese guy, you go get some supplies. We'll meet, meet back here at 5 o'clock. And he says to the Spanish guy, you build a shelter. We'll meet back here at 5 o'clock. And they go, okay, and they all go off. And they all come back at 5 o'clock. The Australian's there. He's killed an animal and he's ready to feed it to everyone for dinner. The, uh, the Spanish guy, he's built a shelter. And they're all like, yeah, good on you, mate. That's awesome. But they can't find the Japanese guy anywhere. And he says to him, where's the Japanese guy? We told him to go off and get some supplies. We can't find him anywhere. All of a sudden, the Japanese guy jumps out from behind the bush and goes, supplies! <laughs> so, so, so I told the joke, and then I tried to get Brad to translate it. And they're going, surprise, 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 surprise. And they're like, oh, crazy white man. Go on, do it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to break my stomach. Um, <laughs> but sometimes you just got to laugh, don't you? We get so serious. Oh, I've got to get on with my ministry and I've got to hear the word of the Lord and I've got to, you know, focus on this. And sometimes I get so serious that I walk over people. Sometimes I get so serious that I don't actually care about the person that's next to me. Pastor Bill Hybels. Uh, pastor of the third largest church in America, Willow Creek, shared the story recently that he's a workaholic. He talked about how, you know how sometimes your schedule gets really booked up and you're really busy? Some people withdraw and chill out and they know how to wind down and they like that and balance things out. He said, I'm a choleric. I'm one of these hard workers that when I get mega booked up and busy, I actually book more stuff in and work harder and I just tread on everyone's toes around me. He said there was several years ago where he was really burnt out, really exhausted, and uh, he'd been saying to his wife, I'm sick of these elders, they're always driving me, they're like slave drivers. He said, I'm sick of the staff, they always just want me to do this for them and that for them, and oh, I'm sick of them. He, he, had, he was having a bad day. I'm sick of the people in my church, they're always asking me to do their weddings and to go off and pray for them and visit them in hospital, or, you, know, you, know, you know, just, he was having a bad day. When a pastor starts saying all that stuff, you know they're having a bad day. Anyway, he said he was at a supermarket. And he was walking towards the exit of the supermarket. And at the same time he was walking towards the exit, he saw a guy in a wheelchair struggling to get out. And he was a Vietnam vet. A lovely old man from his church. And he didn't want to see anyone from church that day. He was, he was burnt out, exhausted, stressed. You know, how you get when you just... Don't want anyone in Oh my goodness. I don't even care about this lovely Christian man from my church who spent 15 years he made a decision that day that he would always put people first. He said the Lord spoke to him about the parable of the, the lost sheep. You know, where Jesus said, Be prepared to leave the 99 and go after the one. You've got to remember that we're called to love our neighbours, we're called to love one another. Forget about the 99 other busy things you've got to do in your life. Forget about all the busyness and the stress and the workload and the budgets and the schedules and the diary and the stuff you've got to do. Forget about all the busy things. Think about the one person that God puts in front of you. And Bill Hobbles said that was the making of him as a pastor. It was nearly the breaking of him, but it was the making of him. Because it reminded him of what his priorities were in life. And I just think this is such an important one. Uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a church, we've got to learn to get back to the focus of what God's called us to do. Okay, uh, so yeah, point number six, we'll finish there. Uh, move on to number seven. So the proverb there was Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart 
it's good medicine, but a, a crushed spirit dries up the bone. So it's important to have a good laugh if it wasn't. Uh, number seven there, uh, go to bed early. Now this one I'm preaching to my wife all the time, because she's a night owl, and I'm an early worm, early, early bird, early bird, early bird catches the worm, I'm getting my head. I'm an early, early bird. Uh, she, she'll stay up all night reading and watching TV or on the computer or whatever, you know, and then she'll wake up the next morning absolutely exhausted. And for me, I'm going to do breakfast radio, I'm going to get up early. Uh, so we're training ourselves to go to bed early. You know, uh, the Hebrew, uh, the, the Jewish day, you'll see this quote on the screen, the Jewish day is modelled on reference to, uh, in the book of Genesis, there was evening and then there was morning. In the creation account in the first chapter of Genesis, based on the classic rabbinic interpretation of this text, a day in the rabbinic Hebrew calendar runs from sunset at the start of the evening to the next sunset. I actually believe if we had that principle that at sunset, we start preparing for the next day. The next day's actually begun. We start thinking about the next day and go to bed early. Fill up your tank. Uh, research shows any sleep you get between uh, bedtime and midnight is the best sleep for you. After that, it's still good sleep, but physically, any sleep you get before midnight is good for you. My kids go to bed at 7.30. I'm heading for bed 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock the latest. Occasionally I'll start later if I've got friends over or something on I've got to do. I'll start later if I have to. But I've found that in my life, if I don't go to bed early, um, I'm, I'm, I'm no good to anyone the next day. Uh, I just think it's an important principle for us. And in this day and age, everyone thinks, oh, I start late, party, yeah, that's the best time, you know. I actually think the best time of the day is early in the morning. Best time of the day, get up early, seek the Lord early, give me the Word of God. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're up late the night before, it's hard to get up early, isn't it? Go to bed early. I think it's a great principle. Number eight, rest regularly. Pace yourself and stay fresh. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labour in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. What a great promise. God gives good sleep to his beloved. Now I'm claiming that scripture all the time. I just wish my kids would claim that scripture all the time as well. They're often the ones that are awake in the night, not me. Uh, but for me, I just think it's such an important thing uh, to ask the Lord for good sleep. We, we pray for the kids every night for the Lord to give them good dreams, to, to give them a good sleep. Carl and I will pray together before we go to bed every night. Uh, it's an important part, part of our thing that we ask the Lord to give us good sleep. If you're struggling with good sleep, Ask the Lord. He gives good gifts to his children. He wants to bless you. He wants to bring healing to you in your sleep. He wants to give you prophetic dreams uh, and good dreams in your sleep. He doesn't want to make you think about snakes and things like that and, and things like that. You know, he wants to give you good stuff. So ask the Lord to bless you in, in your sleep each night. Uh, rest regularly, pace yourself and stay fresh. Uh, I do love uh, in uh, the Cambodian culture, for example, they have a siesta at lunchtime every day. Because uh, it's the hottest part of the day over there. Um, they close the shops between 12 and 2. Have a, have a nap on the floor and the, you know, at the back in, in the shops. And then they work for the rest of the day until sundown, until, until dinner time. I actually think there's a, an important lesson. It, even in Japan, they've got little, little uh, hotel rooms you can buy for an hour or two. to have a lunchtime snooze. Um, I actually think there's a good principle. If you're up really early in the morning, come around midday, uh, one o'clock, have a power nap. Sometimes I'll have a power nap for 20 minutes um, just before the kids go home from school or something like that. It refreshes me and I can power on for the rest of the night. Uh, nothing wrong with it. Don't feel guilty about having a power nap. Uh, feel free. Uh, make the most of it. Any, any opportunity you get, pace yourself and stay fresh. Number nine, fast regularly and renew your first love. You know, uh, at our church, you know, we're part of the National Day Prayer and Fasting Team and uh, I just believe that Fasting is one of the lost arts of Christendom. I believe as a Christian, it should be a regular part of our life. Jesus said in the Word of God uh, to the Pharisees, he said, well, sorry, he said to his disciples, when you fast, anoint your head with oil uh, so that you're not putting on a show, don't walk around all somber and, and grumpy, uh, act like just any, any, any normal person but when you fast. He doesn't say if you fast, he says when you fast. Uh, I actually believe that when you fast, it's time to... Draw near to God. 
sacrifice food or sacrifice electronic media or sacrifice, you can do a daniel fast, but you're fasting meats and sweets, uh, just eating God's lollies, you know, fruit and veggies and, and, and rice and things like that. There's different fasts you can do, but it should be a regular part of our Christian life. And I actually believe fasting is like a reset. You know, sometimes um, my phone uh, will do all sorts of funny things on my smartphone because I've been, you know, working on it all day long, doing things, and sometimes it just goes crazy. And sometimes I'll just turn it off for 30 seconds, give her a little sleep, put down a nap, turn it back on, and everything will just work nice again. I actually believe that's what happens when we do a fast. We just reset, refocus on God. We commit ourselves to pressing into God for a season. Don't fast to get something. Fast to give to God. The Bible says we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God, holy and pleasing unto Him. Make it a regular part of your new Christian life to do a fast regularly. I'll often do a fast early in the year, maybe 21 days or 40 days leading up to Easter, to pray and to seek the Lord for our nation and for our church and for my life. Maybe you should consider doing a fast. Maybe this week you can fast one day. Maybe you can fast one meal. You know, Dr. James Dobson and his wife Shirley would fast one day a week for their children every week. He would fast on a Tuesday or she would fast on a Wednesday and they would spend the whole day praying for their kids, focusing on praying for their kids. And they run focus on the family. Well, they, they, they started focusing on the family, one of the most impacting Christian ministries in the world. And their kids are following the Lord. An amazing testimony because they fasted and gave time to the Lord to, to bless their kids. What has the Lord calling you to do a fast for? He might be asking you to fast and pray for our nation. Fast and pray for the leaders of this church. Fast and pray for your own health. Fast and pray just to get closer to God, whatever. Make it a regular part of our Christian life. It's like a reset button. And the last point there, number 10, do not lose heart. Check your heart regularly. Clean it out daily. One of the uh, greatest diseases in the church today is heart disease. People whose hearts get full of pride. People whose hearts get full of division and gossip and slander. People whose hearts get full of busyness and importance and distraction. The Bible says we've got to guard our hearts. If we want to be well physically, we've got to look after our heart because out of the heart everything flows, doesn't it? That's what the Word of God says in Ephesians 3.13. Therefore I ask you not to lose heart and my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, in the heart, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. You know that verse there it says the power that works within us? That's the Greek word energeo. It's where we get the word energy. You know God gives us his energy at work within us to do what He's called us to do. If you're exhausted, if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're run down, if you're overscheduled, if you're overwhelmed, come to the source. It gives us energy. It gives us power. And He fills our hearts there. It says there that uh, He'll fill our hearts with everything that we need. That Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith. Now just think about that for one moment. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who cast out demons, who raised the dead, we healed the sick, we turned the world upside down, we cared for the leper, we cared for the prostitute, we saw the tax collector's life transformed so much that he gave his money back to the people he stole the money from, the guy who turned the whole world upside down, the guy who rose from the dead on the third day, Christ, the Son of God, dwells in our hearts. Wow. That just blows me away. If Jesus Christ is dwelling in your heart, you should be full of energy. You should be full of fire, full of passion, full of enthusiasm for what God has for you. 
There's a little Welsh preacher years ago that got up and preached a famous sermon after the Welsh revival in, in England. And he got up and he said, God is awesome. God is mighty. God is powerful. God is a miracle working God. God can do anything. All things are possible for those who believe. God is massive. God is the creator. God is this bit. He preached for like 45 minutes just about how good God is, how awesome God is. And then he finished his sermon and he kept going, God is mighty. God is the king of kings. God is the alpha and the omega. And he finished his sermon and he said, and if this God lives in you, then surely the neighbours should notice. He closed his Bible and he sat down. If this God lives in you, surely the neighbours should notice. Surely everyone should see the light that's shining out of you because of the love of Christ inside your heart. Friend, if you're dry today, if you're empty today, if your tank is running low, I want you to have a look through these principles from the Word of God, some of these lifestyle principles here. Look at some of these things here and think, what can I change in my life? So this is the thing about having a life on the Word of God. We hear the Word of God, but if we don't act on it, we're like our life built on the sin. This is your challenge today. Hear the Word of God and obey it. Because that's when your life's on the rock. That's when your heart is filled. That's when you're full of energy. That's when you'll fulfill the mission of God's will to do. Let's bow our heads and let's just pray what the worship seems to come. Heavenly Father, today we come before you and we ask you to come and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit today. Lord, we thank you that you're the one who gives strength to the weary and you increase the power of the weak. Thank you, Lord, that for those who hope in you, we will renew our strength. We will soar on wings like eagles. We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not be faint. Today, Father, I pray that for anyone here that's drained, anyone that's exhausted, anyone that's run down, that you will just come and fill them afresh with the Holy Spirit today. God, we're, we're sorry for running ahead of you and getting over scheduled and stressed out, and run down. Lord Jesus, we don't want to go ahead of you, we don't want to go behind you, we want to go with you. But to do that, we need to confess our sin and confess our weaknesses. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us and refresh us. Really believe the Lord put in my heart today that a number of people are going to be touched with a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would empower them to get on with what God's called them to do. Believe it. For the Holy Spirit to come and touch people right now, wherever they are. Just while we're praying, with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you'd like to get your heart right with Jesus today, If you're not sure that your heart's right with Jesus, if you'd like to give your heart to Him today, if you'd like to make Jesus your Lord and Saviour, if you'd like to be born again and have your sins forgiven, and you want to say yes to Jesus today, you want to say, Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that you rose from the dead. And I thank you that you could wash away my sins through the blood you shed on the cross. If you'd like to give your heart to Jesus today with every eye closed and every head bowed, just slip up your hand right now and say, yes, Jesus, I give my heart to you today. Is there anyone here today who wants to say yes to Jesus for the first time? Okay, the second question I'm going to ask with every eye closed. Is your tank empty? Are you exhausted? Are you drained? Are you weary? And do you need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit today? If that's you, just slip up your hand right now. Yeah, I see that, mate. That's good. Yep, yep, I see those hands. Yeah, that's good. Let's stand to our feet and let's pray. Just ask that you put your hands out to God. Just get ready to receive as we stand now as we pray. Let's all stand and let's just receive from God. Father, I pray. I pray, God, that we'll stop trying to do things in our own strength, in our own way. That we will have a transformation in our hearts today and we'll do things your way. May we be a people who can laugh and be full of joy. May we be a people who know what it is to fill our tanks. 
and to avoid the things that drain our, our tanks. May we be a people who know what it is to get before you at the start of every day and fill our tanks with the Holy Spirit and prayer and the Word of God and worship. God, as we make this fresh commitment to you today, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come. And I pray for this next two months, for the rest of 2013, for the rest of this year, Lord God. I pray we'll have the best two months of our lives, Lord God. That we'll be energised, empowered, fired up, ready for whatever you have for us next, Lord God. And I pray that 2014 will be even ten times greater than ever before. That we'll be fired up more than ever before for the calling you place in our lives, Lord God. And it's because we are asking for the Holy Spirit. You said, Jesus, how much more? Jesus, you said, how much more will I give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? Lord, today we're asking for more of the Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh today, we pray. In Jesus' name. Just as we close the service today, guys.